This is the story of Richard Kelly and Nobuo Fujita. Richard Kelly enlisted in the United States Marine Corps and in February of 1945 found himself storming the beaches of Iwo Jima, a battle in which 70,000 American troops involved took 7,000 KIA, 19,000 wounded. The 22,000 defenders of this tiny island off the coast of Japan all died except for 216 who were captured. In 1932, Fujita joined the Imperial Japanese Navy and became a pilot in 1933. He later lost his younger brother in the war. More importantly, he later became a pilot of seaplanes launched from submarines and was involved in a number of recon missions, including the one for the Pearl Harbor attack, although due to a mechanical failure, he wasn't actually involved in that, but did a number of surveys throughout the Pacific, including New Zealand, Sydney Harbor, and Australia. And on September 9th of 1942, found his submarine just off the coast of Oregon, where he was launching a special attack that had been his own idea. And he flew his plane from, uh, from the submarine towards Wheeler, Wheeler Ridge on Mount Emily in Oregon, where he dropped two incendiary bombs with the aim of starting a large forest fire that would draw resources away from the fight in the Pacific. Fortunately, it had been raining the night before, and a couple of fire lookouts from the National Park there were able to contain the blaze until some uh, backup came and, and they were able to extinguish it relatively easily. Incidentally, on their way home from uh, to Japan, the submarine torpedoed and sank the SS Camden and the SS Larry Doheny, but not before also sinking the Soviet submarine L-16, which was in transit between Dutch Harbor, Alaska, and San Francisco, because they mistook it for an American submarine. Um, the United, the, the, the Russia and, and Japan were, were were not at war at the time. Fast forward a couple decades to 1962 and Fujita was invited to the city of Brookings, a mere 16 miles from the site of the uh, incendiary bomb attack, as a guest of honor for the annual Azalea Festival. Of course, the Japanese government decided to get reassurance that the U.S. government would not be trying Fujita for war crimes and just in case his reception uh, w was not what he expected. Uh, Fujita said he was, he was ashamed of his actions during the war and was, was going to apologize. And This is no small apology when you, when you look back in time and you realize, I'm sorry for trying to kill you all. I'm sorry I was, I was part of that war effort. I'm sorry I was on a submarine that did kill so many American sailors. And so he brought, it, he brought his, his family's 400-year-old samurai sword as a gesture of peace and, and, and friendship and, and, and symbolic of his shame and apology. He wanted to, to give up this sword, a samurai sword that had been in his family longer than America has been in existence to this day. And he was so ashamed and, and sh so afraid of what his reception might be that we only found this out later. Apparently, he said he had intended to use the sword to commit ritual suicide, Harakiri, uh, if, 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 if he had a hostile reception, and he almost did. He almost did. There was a petition going around town saying that he shouldn't be allowed to be a part of this. He shouldn't be invited back at all. He should be treated as an enemy. But the city decided, despite that, they were going to make him the local hero for the day, and they did. And he, he, was, he, he always apologized profusely. He, he came back to the city several times in, uh, in 1990, in 1992, and 1995. In 1992, he planted a tree at the bomb site as a gesture of peace. And in 1995, 
he moved the samurai sword himself from Brookings City Hall into the library's display case where it is to this day and you'll see why that's important in just a minute but he was also made an honorary citizen of Brookings, Oregon just several days before his death at a hospital in Japan on September 30th in 1997 at the age of 85. So back to Richard Kelly because as he said, he would have been one of the signers of that petition, but it was only a few years ago that he actually moved to Brookings, Oregon. And when he did, he went to the library and saw the samurai sword. Uh, and, and when he did, well, he had never written a letter of complaint in his life, but had his wife uh, type this up for him. And as she said, by, by the time I finished typing the letter, I was in tears because then I understood. She understood why he had been obsessed with the sword, why this had been such an issue for him, why this had, had set him off. As, as he wrote in the letter, quote, I fought too long and too hard for the United States of America to see an enemy attacker being glorified with public money. He described Iwo Jima as a bloodbath and said that 60 years later he still can't bring himself to even take the shrink wrap off the movie Sands of Iwo Jima. I haven't, quote, I haven't gotten that far yet. I lost too many friends. So the story I'm getting this from is from CBS from 2009 and this was a reporter who had gone back to Brookings and the first time he met with, with Kelly He, he wasn't able to talk about it. But he went back and he said, quote, I had changed a lot and I've changed for the better. I'm not living in the ghosts of the guys that got killed. Kelly says what made the difference was realizing that for the past 60 years he'd been carrying an enormous load of guilt, guilt that he survived and his friends didn't. And Kelly says once he saw that, quote, I started looking at the sword situation down there and I realized that it's ancient history. And now, he's a volunteer at the library and is responsible for maintaining the display. As the, the last line of the story says, and that's the story of how two proud soldiers both found their peace at a little library on the Oregon coast. When I was in Fallujah in 2004 with the Marines, I had a staff sergeant on my team who was... Uh, kind of, aside from being in my chain of command, both a, a mentor and a big brother to me. Ironically, his, his last name is also Kelly. And Staff Sergeant Kelly, he asked me, after telling me this story, he told me the story of his grandfather, who was a World War II veteran, who fought in Europe and got to take his daughters to the sites of the battles where he had fought and said this is where it happened and this is this is this is what it was and this is something that should never happen again and yet there's Staff Sergeant Kelly in Fallujah in 2004 wondering and he didn't think it was possible he didn't think he didn't think that that even the people of Iraq and the United States could come to the point <laughs> <laughs> where, where, where we could have even the, the possibility of tourism but between our two countries. That forever the relationship would be managed and defined by that which our governments had done to each other. And now, it seems we're on an inevitable course to another war with Iran. And I just, I tell this story because I can't imagine that in 2000 fucking 12, that in the age of the internet with this historical perspective, with the ability to see this, how is war not just totally 
fucking embarrassing. Governments fool us over and over and over again with the same bullshit, the same lies. And I, 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 can't, I can't look at the world and believe that we can't stop this war from happening. That when Richard Kelly says that for 60 years he had to live with this guilt that he survived and his friends didn't. Well, I would hope that with the perspective that we have today, that any of you watching this who see what I see going on in the world, who see this war coming, who know that people will die if we don't stop it, your guilt if you have any conscience, should be far worse than that which Richard Kelly lived with. So the question is how, and I don't know. I don't know. Obviously, I'm, if you know what I'm up to, I'm organizing Veterans for Ron Paul 2012. We're going to be marching on the RNC in August, at the end of August. But I don't know if that won't be too late. So I wish I had some solution for you. But all I have is an invitation. I'm asking the question, how do we do this? How do we stop a war with Iran? And I don't know the answer. But I have a way to start the conversation. There's a forum up now at, at adamversustheman.com and there's uh, a topic I started there. And I'd hope that you join the conversation. Because I don't want to live with that guilt and I hope you don't either. Because we see it coming. It's like a slow motion train wreck that you just watch in horror. But I'm not going to watch in horror this time. I'm going to be doing something about it and I don't know what. But I'm not going to live with the guilt that I didn't do something to stop this war from happening.